so we are going to have uh, the, this session, unique challenges in reducing cancer health disparities. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Damiano Rondelli, a great friend of mine. He is head of hematology oncology at the University of Illinois. And he has helped, uh, he has worked with us uh, for the last uh, several years, and uh, specifically for Bone Marrow Transplant Center where we work together. And it has been a successful, uh, very successful from our standpoint, foundation standpoint, and successful from UIC standpoint. And he joined by Dr. Bill Hall. He is my partner, a community oncologist, because we need to have community physicians as part of this. We can't just have professors, right? <laughs> so um, I would like uh, Dr. Hall and Dr. Rondelli to uh, moderate this session. Thank you, Binay. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, been a great success, this first meeting of the Binay Tower Foundation. And I, I look forward to more meetings and more people. But I think we started. It's not going to stop. Um, it's a great pleasure for, for us, for me today, to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Tim Erickson. Uh, Tim has been a long friend of mine at the University of Illinois Chicago. He's right now is the, he's an emergency medicine physician at the Brigham and Women Hospital in Boston, where he serves as a, the chief of medical toxicology in the uh, Department of Emergency Medicine. He's also a teaching faculty member at Harvard Medical School and is a core faculty member of the uh, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative in Cambridge. Uh, his expertise is in environmental toxicology and crisis in climate change. He's also the author of a book on toxicology. It's not really here, but I know that. It's a, it's a, it, it, his book on toxicology has been translated in how many languages? Uh, about 14. 14 languages. Uh, so he's a very well-known uh, expert. And he's worked, uh, he's, he's trained in Chicago, he's uh, been a faculty at the University of Illinois at Chicago for many years, where he was the director and the founder of the Center for Global Health. And uh, uh, he was also the associate dean for health affairs there, and has been a, a great leader uh, at UIC until he moved to, to Harvard. Um, his uh, passion and uh, expertise combined together uh, has always been in global health, and he's been working um, in, in all over the world. I think that there's no uh, continent where he's not been and has not worked in, and uh, his uh, enthusiasm and passion has been very contagious at UIC, where I'm still, uh, I'm still there, so I have to continue his legacy. Uh, so uh, his, uh, his current interest, actually, at Harvard has been also um, on, as you, the title today is on health, uh, in an area of conflict and disasters which I think is a, a growing area of interest for research purposes, but also for a, in a humanitarian perspective. So I'm, I'm really excited and happy to welcome Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Damiano and Dr. Hall, uh, Dr. Shah, Benet, it's great to see you, and Tara and Briley. Thanks for all your, your wonderful work behind the scenes. So we're going to get through a lot of things in the, in the next few minutes. I also gave uh, uh, Benet and Briley uh, an issue of this lecture that has a lot of texts and words. This morning, though, I'm going to show you more pictures <laughs> to keep you awake, uh, but I assure you there is a lot of text behind it and peer-reviewed articles that make this not my opinion, but hopefully um, more academic-based. Let's click this forward. Is that going? There we go. All right, uh, we're really in an age now of a migration, of immigration, of refugees. Some of these individuals seek asylum. Some of them seek to go to another country or part of the world to better their financial status, maybe school for their children, safety, political, religious reasons. Others are forced, and we've never quite seen this much migration in our world as probably since World War II. And here are just some quick maps of since the 1500s, over the past five, 600 years, we've seen a lot of migration, some forced, some by choice, some coming from Europe to the New World and the Americas because of religious and new frontiers, others forced by slavery, uh, and uh, we're well in tune with that. And 
this day and age, we're kind of getting a, a mix of that. Here is a more current map. And with migration, with immigration, with refugees, and in a little bit we'll define the difference between those, there are risks. They put themselves at great risk. They put themselves, their family at risk. Oftentimes they'll send their family. They'll stay in the mother country. Oftentimes they'll leave. They'll leave family. And they may never see their family again. So with migration comes fatalities. And we're just starting to track this, but it's woefully underreported, as you might imagine. And uh, North Africa, Middle East, there's been a lot of crossing now. Uh, Dr. Rondelli into your homeland uh, across in not only Italy but certainly into Greece, Macedonia and then curling all the way up into the other European countries. And 2015 was a big year of migration, 2016 was probably the biggest spike in fatalities at least that we know of. And this is a boat coming from northern Africa. Their countries are not countries of destination. Um, I know our current administration has a different name for these types of countries. These are patients and people that are in need and most of them are seeking asylum and are being forced out because their lives are in danger. And we'll see if this works. This is a day-to-day -day current map of migration. As you can see, this is really quite cool. It shows the massive migration that's occurring in the world today. And then if you watch it a while, it'll be very specific to the United States, specific to the UK, specific to Australia and other countries. And can someone tell me how many migrants right now do they think are in motion? Take a, uh, within 10 million. <laughs> Anyone want to take a stab at this? Dr. Wynn, what do you think? 50 million? 260 million. So almost the size of our country, it's like another nation milling around uh, the, the corners of the world. And with that, there's language, there's cultural barriers, they're coming into new areas where you may not understand their religion, where they're from, they can't speak the language, and then you start thinking, well, what about health disparities? What about cancer health disparities? We were just talking about screening programs and financing these programs. Well, what if you are unable to communicate, you're not welcomed, and you're actually fearful that you're gonna get deported, you're not gonna be very enthused about cancer screening programs, and you're thinking about day to day, not 10, 15, 20 years down the line, and you're thinking of your family, not your own health. And uh, Damiano, you taught me this a long time ago that the word cancer, we know it well, and we know the zodiac sign, is not necessarily a word that's in every language. So there are some languages that don't even recognize this as an entity. And if you are diagnosed with cancer, there's something wrong with you and you're ostracized. So no one is really, in some of these really austere settings, motivated to be screened, let alone treated. And we know about the disparities. This conference beautifully has talked about it. Uh, there is no health care in several corners of the world. About a billion people never see a health care provider in their entire life, one-seventh of the globe. And you can imagine that is just exponentially increased per capita if you're a refugee or a migrant. And we know that cancer is the second leading cause of death worldwide beyond cardiovascular disease. One in six have cancer. And again, this is probably underreported because we just don't have the worldwide uh, screening abilities. In the low to middle income countries, particularly low income countries, okay, there is a huge global burden of cancer and it's shifting that way in the world and away from industrialized medicine. And are there racial disparities? This particular article looked at breast cancer disparities. Just imagine if you're a migrant, a refugee, your diet change, nutrition, stress, urbanization, environmental pollutants, carcinogens, your chance of cancer actually goes up. Childhood cancer, we're making a lot of amazing advances on that, life-saving advances, but children throughout the world aren't caught up to those, particularly with AML, ALL, despite the advances we've made here in this country, uh, they really don't benefit from them. And they're often either misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, or not diagnosed at all. 
And then there's the elderly. Uh, the older patients, over half of cancers worldwide are in our geriatric patient population. That's only going to go up. I know Benet and Tara has done a lot of work in Nepal uh, with the older population that has no means of cancer care, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and certainly no palliative care or pain medication care. So this is going to be a dramatic shift as well. And just even in Malaysia as an example, cancers are different depending where you are. Here, we know colorectal is number four, there it's number two, and it's climbing as that population ages. So we're seeing different types of cancer. In particular, and this would interest uh, Rob Wynn, is lung cancer. It is coming back, particularly in migrant patient populations, and interestingly, amongst females. Why? Because the tobacco companies are pushing for young women to pick up the habit of smoking because it's highly addictive and they're less apt to stop smoking. So we're seeing now more lung cancer, gastric cancer, liver cancer. In these types of populations, we would normally see, of course, we're used to prostate, lung, colorectal, breast, but this is a different area. And if you look at the indigent populations like Aboriginal in Australia and New Zealand, despite the fact they've been there many more centuries and millennia than the non-indigenous people, their risk of getting cancer is higher, particularly those that are preventable like cervical cancer. And we know this, I think this was discussed at this conference and beautifully so, that this is one of the cancers that's preventable. We can diagnose it, we can screen for it, but the problem in these patient populations, if you're on the move, so you diagnose cervical cancer, what are you going to do about it? Where are you going to send them? Who's going to intervene? Who's going to do the surgery? Who's going to give them chemotherapy? So it's a, a definitely a maldistribution of wealth and health care. This is a Somali um, a couple of uh, women. What state has more Somali immigrants, refugees, migrants than any other state? Minnesota, it's really interesting, it is. Um, Minnesota is very well known for its health care system at Mayo Clinic, University of Minnesota, high, high quality, and yet to reach this patient population has been very difficult with screening for pap smears, uh, looking for cervical cancer, or getting mammography for breast cancer. It's hard to reach them, it's a different culture. Uh, this is a Filipino woman. Right now the Philippines are in conflict. There's a leadership that is not pro-woman. And Philippine women tend to get breast cancer at a much earlier age compared to uh, Western populations or even other Asian populations. And yet the screening programs have almost come to a halt uh, because of conflict. And with some cultures, these are Bosnian women after the Bosnian War, their privacy is very important, and they're not going to open up. They are even reluctant to self-examine, let alone be examined by an unknown physician, be it a male. And for those that are coming in for screening, there's other things going on. They're children. What are they going to do with their children? They're modest. They're being told not to go. Maybe the male-dominated society won't let them go. And then once you diagnosed the cancer, how are you going to treat it? How are you going to treat it? So what is the difference between an immigrant, a migrant, and a refugee? We hear this tossed around all the time. Anyone want to take a stab at that? Well, a refugee is seeking asylum. Yeah, okay, a refugee is seeking asylum, good. Good. And the migrants kind of in between. Actually, I got something for you. You know, uh, good chocolate is cancer uh, preventing. Dark, dark chocolate actually endangered species. All the money that goes to this goes to saving endangered species with the black man. Light of the subject, but this is a heavy conference, a heavy topic, and you have to have a, just a little fun. But you did well. So immigrants choose to go. They're choosing citizenship. They want to stay there. Refugees are forced to go. Usually it has to be 
threat of life and limb, and yet, in some countries, they have to prove it. They have to prove they're a refugee. How do you do that when you've been in the middle of Syria? Migrants, on the other hand, are kind of between. They're leaving for socioeconomic, maybe religious reasons. They want to go to an area that maybe is a safe haven with the motivation of going back. They really do want to go back. And yet what countries are doing, they're very reluctant to call migrants refugees. Why? Because once you're a refugee, they cannot kick you out. And if you're there in some countries for up to five years, you become a citizen. So there is a big push to not call these displaced, asylum-seeking individuals refugees. So that's why you hear these uh, interchanging terms. Uh, even in the Latin American countries, there's disparities within the country, different countries, access to health care, certainly pain medications, palliative care. And how many are surgical oncologists in the crowd? There's usually a couple. This is a huge need. And those with solid tumors don't have surgeons to take them out. Yes, there's bone marrow transplant. Yes, there's chemotherapy. But oftentimes, these patients need surgical intervention. Then you get to these countries. My mom is Danish. She always says we are the happiest people on Earth. Uh, and I believe that she is. Um, but when you take in refugees and migrants, do they get the same type of care? And if they're immigrants with other family members there, they get better care than if they're a migrant. Even the Danes, who take great pride in opening their doors and being all about the world, we're all the same human race, uh, there's disparities. And then Germany took on a lot of Syrians. And I have German friends, I'm not of German descent, I'm a Norwegian descent. Uh, they say a lot of this had to do not just with the Markel regime of feeling it was the right thing to do despite being under heavy fire, but because of what happened in World War II. They really feel they need to open their doors, and yet there's population issues, there's workforce issues, it's always political, but Germany has really taken on a lot of these individuals. And yet what happens to the young girls, the adolescents, do they come in, do they go through screening programs, immunizations? Studies are showing not, um, and particularly if they're first generations. If their parents immigrated or migrated in and they were born in that country, they're much more likely to seek health care. And then the women uh, are, they're not as mobile, they're confined, they have higher rates of cancer, and again, it's different types of cancer. It's not necessarily breast, lung, prostate, colorectal. And then the males, who many have come from male-dominated societies, are no longer the breadwinners, they're no longer in control, they're massed together, there's a high, high rate of mental health disorders and depression, and they are not motivated to get cancer screening. They just aren't. And again, they're thinking day to day how to live day to day. Some countries are doing better than others. Canada takes great pride in taking in these individuals and giving them equal health care. Uh, Norway does as well, and they're even finding they're doing such a good job, cancer rates are lower <laughs> in the refugee migrant population than in their own indigent population. Again, more lung, prostate, um, breast cancer, and much more gastric, liver, cervical um, cancer in the refugees and migrants. And Switzerland even said, we're going to take them in and give them universal health care. And yet, universal health care really isn't covering these individuals as much as they would like to think. And it's not just the country you end up in. You're migrating through several territories. So there's state-to-state -state conflict. There's urbanization. There's even intra-culture, tribal clashes because they're all thrown in together in a big mass line and in one common encampment. Global climate change. Does it have anything to do with cancer? Well, it has a lot to do with a lot of things. Yes, it does. It's not just what it's doing to the climate itself, but the natural resources. So if you have no water or you don't have a clean water support, you're not going to be growing healthy foods with antioxidants. You're going to be eating bad foods, contaminated foods, carcinogenic foods. You're going to be going to areas where they're using bad chemicals and pesticides. So absolutely. These are migrants, refugees from Iraq, four million of them. We're not really sure if they're getting any much in the way of cancer screening. 
Syria is probably now the ones with the most refugees coming out. And it's not just those that are leaving Syria into Turkey, into Jordan, into Lebanon, going into Europe, but it's those that are internally displaced and in these besieged areas. And if you look at Syria, if you know it as a healthcare system in Damascus, it was quite premier in the Middle East. In fact, a lot of board certification for those physicians, nurses, healthcare providers in the Middle East, they go to Damascus to get that board certification. This is not a backwards country that had a poor healthcare system. It was excellent, and yet it's been decimated. And not only is the healthcare system decimated, but there's a huge exodus of healthcare providers. Why? Because they're under fire. They're being targeted as well. And uh, then just crossing the border into Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. And what country takes in more refugees than any other country? I want to make sure I adhere to my time. Jordan. Who said Jordan? That's absolutely right. You want chocolate? <laughs> this one is an owl, dark chocolate. What do you call a group of owls? A parliament. And then, yeah. All right, anyway, well, back to the Syria map. But Jordan, I, I got to say, they have no water. They have a, a weak infrastructure health care wise. They have no oil, and yet they've taken in more refugees than any other country in the world. It's followed by Turkey then Pakistan, then Lebanon. U.S. isn't even close to the top 10, if not top 20. Most dangerous job in the world is not being in the Bering Strait uh, going for the biggest catch for the king crab. It's being a health care provider in Syria, the most dangerous job in the world. I have several colleagues who keep going back in. They go to Turkey, they cross the border, life and limb, taking care of children, crossing back over, hoping their family's okay and not being taken out because of what they're doing. They want to go back. They want to rebuild this country. They don't want to go to Europe, the U.S., and Canada. And then what about chemical warfare? That's a whole other area that I study. And um, is there cancer-causing effects in those surviving chemical warfare or the pesticides that are being used? Uh, quickly to Darfur, another very uh, touchy area very hard to go look at cancer data, cancer screening, um, and that has been an ongoing conflict for decades. I did a lot of work in Sudan before it became South Sudan. And a weak, uh, or I wouldn't say weak, but a fragmented healthcare system has been Libya even before the conflict. So how then, after the conflict, do you rebuild that? And then how do you rebuild an oncologic program? And you go to help, you're a humanitarian who means well, you want to save a corner of the world, and you have these people meeting you at the cross, at the border, and you don't know whose side they're on, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, are there any? It's always multifactorial. And then you approach these, and you see child soldiers, and these child soldiers have multiple mental health issues as well as health issues. Uh, that you have to deal with. This is Colombia. There's a lot of internal migration because of the drug wars and the political unrest there. Uh, Middle Europe, Ukraine, uh, a lot of countries now deal with internal migration. Mental health. So you go to a place where there's no shelter, you have post-traumatic stress disorder, and you really have no means. And it's not just the migration itself, it's once you get there, you think you're going to a new life, a safe haven, and then it's no better. You're separated from your family, so the mental health issues really kick in after the migration, after the settlement, as well as well, a low self-esteem, post-traumatic stress disorder. And you may know this better than I, is cancer and stress connected? If you're more stressed out, are you more prone to cancer? They're starting to show that it is. And what is the access to cancer care for these migrants, immigrants, refugees into Europe where most countries don't allow them to use the emergency department and certainly don't give them access to preventative health care? They have found women are getting breast cancer at a much younger age in these war-torn countries. Again, multifactorial, but I have to believe, and the studies are now believing, it's stress-induced. 
as one of the risk factors. There is some good effects of migration. Have you heard of the salmon uh, effect or the Hispanic paradox? where you actually have healthier populations that come into the U.S., work, and go back to their families, and they cross over the border constantly. They are healthier, have less cancer, than those that stay in the United States. Very interesting. But on the other hand, there's something called the Ulysses Syndrome, where once you cross and go through great lengths, endangerment to get to where you're going, and there's separation, you never recover. This is called the Ulysses syndrome. The other things we can do in a pretty bleak picture, we can do a lot. One is cancer registries. There's a maldistribution of that. As you can see, the US, Europe, and Australia are doing well. Not so good in the countries that really need them. Telemedicine is another way we can reach out to these austere environments and areas in need. I heard before I came on about clinical trials. Try doing that in a refugee camp amongst migrants, longitudinal studies, control placebo, and then you go back to follow up on them and they're gone. I have Syrian colleagues that have changed their name four times and their emails seven times because they don't want to be traced and yet they want to tell the story of what's going on. So how do you study those individuals? A lot of people have been refugees. Some of the great minds have been refugees and that really hurts a country because it's brain drain. They want to stay, but if they leave, how does a country recover? Genetic counseling. Who's going to go to genetic counseling for potential cancer screening for 5, 10, 15 years when they're just trying to live a week, two, or three and reunite with their family? And what are the health effects for children who migrate? How many have been uh, first-generation immigrant, migrant, refugee? Yeah. So. You know what that's like. I don't like to show President Nixon too much, so I'm going to click right through that. But he did do uh, something very good. He did a cancer fund, $1.6 billion in 1971, that went to cancer research, cancer prevention. And it really is one of the good things uh, that he did. But you still look, even in the U.S., as has been talked about at this conference, there's disparities with breast and cervical cancer amongst our Native American First Nation women African-American, Latino, Latina, um, still some disparities. And even Obama's new launch to the moon, you know, the cancer moonshot, much like the JFK moonshot for space exploration, trying to end health disparities with cancer research. And that's good for our country, and it's making some inroads. But what about other countries in conflict? Um, briefly, and then I'll close. This is at the border crossing of one of my colleagues with uh, Physicians Without Borders. They have a very difficult time getting medications in and out. There's counterfeiting of medications. There's stealing of medications for more money for arms exchange. And the two biggest medications that are hit are cardiovascular drugs, number one, and number two, pain medications for oncologic patients. So you're getting fake, false pain medications to these cancer victims who don't have access to chemo, radiation, t CAR T-cell, immunotherapy, they can't even get through the pain. And by the time they're diagnosed and they show up for help, it's often advanced stage. And then what do physicians do? Palliative care, you have to reach out to both sides, even if you don't agree with the religion or the culture or the outlook of the other side, we as healthcare providers have to drop that and say we treat all, regardless of where you've been, what you've done. So you're a child soldier that did horrific things, but you were forced to do that. Does that mean that child, now an adult, doesn't get treated? So they all deserve palliative care. Um, just very briefly, we've seen Katrina affect oncologic issue and care. Haiti, the earthquake of 2010, Benet and Tara have done wonderful work in Nepal during, right after, and continue to do great work after the earthquake. What about palliative care, cancer care in the midst of the Ebola epidemic? It was non-existent, and how does that recover? And some disasters begat cancer. Where is this from? It's not Chernobyl, this is actually Fukushima, a very good healthcare system that got fragmented and we worry about 
thyroid. This is Chernobyl. Uh, Damiano and I do a lot of work in, in Ukraine. And uh, a lot of deaths immediately from leukemia, thyroid. Uh, but now even the liquidators that went in, there were 400,000 liquidators, young men, that went back and forth, back and forth to cover the Chernobyl sarcophagus with concrete. They survived, but now they're all coming down with leukemia, and they all need bone marrow transplants, and there's no program in Ukraine to do it. But uh, Dr. Rondelli is working on that with colleagues, and of course, one of the most dramatic ones was Hiroshima and Nagasaki because of the cancer. So refugees are human beings, and I'll close with this. I just tried to show you pictures, and sometimes a picture paints a thousand words, but also words can be more powerful than a picture. I'm just going to read this to you. In a country that's engulfed by war or overrun by a dictator who begins killing its citizens, they are forced to flee. In situations, only compassionate response is to take people in. With the ongoing mass migration to Europe, these refugees pay smugglers to take them to safety, but there is no safe place to go, since no one wants them. They leave in a rush to save their lives and their families due to political and religious fear, death threats, rape of women, or forced labor. They do not have time to mourn losses. There is no time for ideal migration, where the destination countries can choose whom they will take in and welcome them. The initial hope and dream is just to escape to a safe haven. Then it's transformed into a nightmare of humiliation and fear. These asylum seekers will or are already suffering from PSD due to massive psychologic trauma. And that's from uh, a litmus from the Archives of Psychoanalytic Therapy in 2017. So this is my last slide. Refugees, migrants, immigrants suffer from not only psychologic issues, infectious disease issues, but exacerbations and acute onset of things like cancer. And remember the stat, one in six in the world has some type of cancer or are about to undergo a hematologic, oncologic issue. In this boat here, there's 12. So two of these people have cancer. Which ones are they and how are you gonna figure it out? So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Erickson, for a very humbling talk. Um, our next speaker, I think, probably doesn't need much introduction because he so brilliantly participated in the debate yesterday. Um, Dr. Ramsey, if you'd like to come up. And Dr. Ramsey's going to be talking to us about oncology business models, the need for disruptive models. After a talk like that, it's, it's hard to uh, follow. Um, this is kind of head snapping uh, change in direction here. So uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, interesting. Um, it's going to be very local and maybe a little bit um, um, cerebral. Ooh, but there's still some chocolates left. So yeah. perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I can uh, through, do some Q&A during this and reward with chocolate. This is exciting. <laughs> All right. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, disrupting the oncology practice business model. Um, and, and for those of you that were at the debate uh, yesterday, I think we heard a lot of information about why maybe disruption might be a good idea uh, in, in oncology. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about after sort of going over a bit about the disruption issue is what we're trying to do locally here in Seattle, uh, specifically with, with our organization at the Fred Hutch um, in terms of disruption. Because honestly, as I've talked uh, around the country about the problems in oncology, um, I get a lot of shrugs, to be honest, from the business community, from the insurance community. Um, and the, the thought is we can't touch cancer. Cancer is off limits uh, for disruption because it is a, uh, you know, it, it's laden with fear and large uh, connotations of denying uh, very ill patients um, needed therapies. Uh, and that's clashing, of course, with the reality of this cost um, issues. But you know, on, on the plus side, I mean, we have to say there are, there are, it's an exciting time in oncology. Um, we're, we're seeing an unprecedented number of new therapies that are coming to the fore, some uh, with great promise. Uh, we have strong networks throughout the country that provide excellent, excellent cancer care. 
Um, and at least for the moment, uh, although it is being whittled away, I think in general we've had a tremendous uh, expansion of health care availability through insurance in the Affordable Care Act that has given more patients, people, access to cancer care earlier in their trajectory. Um, oncologists, I think their, their job is becoming more rewarding as their patients live longer and better lives. They see these exciting treatments and are eager to have the chance to use them. Um, and it's still a very financially rewarding uh, profession. That said, there's a lot of uh, issues that uh, we're all facing as a society. Um, patients face very fragmented care, and I hear this almost daily um, in my work at the Fred Hutch. Uh, there's still problems with insurance denials and patients having fear of not getting the care they need because of coverage issues. Uh, as I said yesterday, there's huge problems with financial toxicity. Um, probably at least a third, probably more of our uh, cancer patients are ex experiencing extreme financial toxicity during their cancer care. The oncologist, because of the cost pressures, uh, is, is, are really being squeezed to try to uh, manage uh, their spend. There's increasing regulation and operation burdens. Um, and like all of medicine, there's a lot of burnout going on in oncology. Um, and the payers, I hear from them also every week about the, uh, their complaints about high cost therapies where they don't see the evidence of benefit um, and the practice variability. So um, just to put some numbers with this, I mean, most studies that we look at in cancer costs compared to other sectors of the healthcare uh, system show that cancer costs are rising faster than, than any other segment in healthcare. Uh, and far faster than um, U.S. GDP. Healthcare in general for the last 30, maybe 40 years has been rising at at least twice uh, the rate of, the, of inflation in the general economy, so we're taking more and more of our economy and putting it into healthcare. Cancer is an accelerator, is much higher rate of spend growth. Uh, this is data, and I just want to show this to highlight this problem in variation in care quality and cost. I'm going to show a couple of more slides uh, later about this. This is data from our own uh, Washington State uh, registry, cancer registry, which we linked with uh, multiple insurance providers. And this is a, a slide showing variability in uh, the early diagnosis stage uh, or for patients with uh, early stage prostate cancer. And the adherence on the right side uh, refers to uh, use, or, or I should say non-use, of advanced imaging in early stage uh, prostate cancer, PET scans, MRI scans. Um, and then on the uh, x-axis, it's variability in cost. And what you can see, these individual dots are clinics uh, within our state, and you can see this tremendous variability. Some clinics are close to 100% in not ordering expensive imaging tests. Others are down in the 20% range in terms of uh, ordering uh, where it's not recommended. And then, of course, you see this huge variation in cost um, ranging from $2,000 to $12,000 just in this little uh, window, plus and minus two months after diagnosis. So tremendous variability. And this is a study that we published back in 2013 looking at uh, this issue of financial toxicity. Um, and it did sort of start a, a wave of uh, follow-on studies uh, looking at this issue where we found in Washington State, we had a federal judge uh, here who allowed us to link federal bankruptcy records with our cancer registry uh, and then compare that to people without cancer. And we found that uh, people with cancer were 2.65 times on average more likely to go bankrupt uh, over the coming years than uh, individuals who didn't have cancer. And it actually varied tremendously from cancer to cancer. Some cancers, the risk of bankruptcy was 11-fold higher. So, you know, I think there's good arguments there for disrupting. You know, we need to improve the patient experience. It's not where it needs to be. We need to help oncology practices manage their patients more effectively. This variation that I just showed is a tremendous problem. I've, been, I've seen this uh, studying cancer care delivery for the last 15 years, um, and it hasn't changed. And so we need to reduce that variability. And this new problem of financial toxicity, I think many of the advocacy organizations will tell you that this has now become the number one problem that their, pay, their members are facing, financial burden. We've got to get that uh, addressed. But as I said at the start, it's really hard to disrupt 
Uh, and many people have told me that I shouldn't go there in cancer, we just can't change this paradigm. Um, there's huge information gaps. I, I thought Congressman Smith said it well yesterday when he said, you know, when you're sick, in pain, scared, you go to your doctor, the doctor's God, he tells you what to do and you're gonna follow. And I think that's very true in, in many cases uh, in cancer. We don't, you know, the patients don't have information and they don't have the ability to seek that information. So that creates a, creates a real disparity uh, that's hard to get over. There are huge silos in care everywhere, in the insurance industry, in the cancer delivery system, even within patient advocacy groups, um, there are silos that prevent organized working together. The payment model, as we heard yesterday, has perverse financial incentives, and unfortunately that model really isn't going away, so it's still gonna be something we have to deal with. Uh, there are monopolies, uh, practices are combining and, and, and really becoming monopolies within communities, uh, and they can dictate price uh, and output, and that's very hard to break. Um, and then underlying all of this, as I mentioned, is the problem that, that patients who have cancer and their family members are afraid, and it's, it's important uh, that that's to recognize that as a barrier to the, you know, the, the idea that we can have these folks shop around and just um, you know, pick the best care for the best person. It's hard to do that when you're fearing for your life. So with all of that going on, you know, where do we begin? Many roads to take, uh, many opportunities for disruption, um, but you know, lots of barriers. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, at the Fred Hutch. Um, and this is a project I started uh, five years ago. Um, you can see the Fred Hutch's mission here. Um, the mission is to reduce cancer as the cause of suffering and death. I went to our center director five years ago and I said, you know, this stuff I'm seeing with this disparity in access and these crushing costs is, is threatening the Hutch's mission. And we need as an organization to find a way to, to deal with that. So we created an entity within the Hutch, an institute called the Hutchinson Institute for Cancer Outcomes Research. Um, and you can see uh, our mission statement here, which riffs off of the Hutch's statement, but is really uh, looking at trying to reduce the uh, economic and human burden of cancer so that we can get closer to the Hutch's global mission of eliminating cancer. So how do we do this? Well, we're doing it locally, but we're hoping this is a model that will translate nationally. We're building a regional network uh, of people who are often um, antagonistic to each other, cancer providers, insurance executives, patients, and researchers. But we bring these people together with the goal of trying to find solutions, shared priorities for value-driven, clinically relevant, actionable things that we can do. And as an organization, what we do is we measure those areas that are of interest and, and help try to design interventions to improve them. Uh, we've been lucky, this has been embraced, and so we've built this uh, learning healthcare network with a lot of participants, and you can see the list here. There is a long list of insurers, uh, providers, many of the provider groups here today, um, and uh, foundations focused on improving quality and value. We uh, have a, a, a living laboratory that includes um, pretty much every major cancer oncology practice in the state, uh, 22 practices, five public and private insurers, uh, quality organizations, professional societies, uh, and an ad, a, a nice and very active advocacy group. So we're trying to build a research-ready network uh, to employ to try to solve some of these problems in cancer care delivery. And our model is, is fairly simple. Um, we, we first start by measurement, and I'm gonna show you some preliminary uh, results of our measurement of cancer and care in our community, because you can't fix if you don't know what, you know what the problem is. So we need to find across a broad spectrum you know, what's going on so we can focus on that. We engage stakeholders with, uh, within the network um, and we let their priorities be our, our priorities, not the other way around. We bring these folks together at, at something called the Value and Cancer Care Summit um, every year, it's gonna happen next week, um, where we, we focus on solving problems and develop shared solutions. And then we use our network and our, our resources uh, to design interventions, work with these organizations, um, but also have high science. So we can do an intervention 
in a way to understand whether it works or not. And then use the same database that we use for performance measurement to see if things change. Um, and if they change, we should adopt those things. If they don't, we need to move on to the next intervention. So as I said, you, you can't change something if you can't measure it, or at least it's hard to, to figure out what to do. So we have built uh, a database um, that's somewhat unique, I think, uh, in the nation. Uh, we've been able to uh, convince the, the major public and private insurance companies uh, in the state to give us regular feeds of their enrollment and claims data, with we, which we link with the two major cancer registries that cover all of our state population. The SEER Cancer Registry, which is based at the Fred Hutch, and the Washington State Cancer Registry, which is based in Olympia. So through that database, we have uh, now identified, we have 100,000 patients with cancer we've identified in our state. Uh, we've followed those to the, to the time of death. Um, it's about 70 to 75% um, of all patients with cancer in our state. Um, we build something uh, called, we're building something called the State Community Cancer Care Report. I'll give you a little window on what lo that looks like. But we're building this through a process that includes engagement um, and multiple uh, steps that involve the actors that are involved, the patients, the providers, the health insurers. And we've been doing this over years. Um, one of the problems that we sometimes happens in performance measurement is there's no engagement with the people who are affected by measures, and so you throw these measures out into the community, showing some clinics doing really well and some doing poorly, and it creates chaos. Um, and this happened uh, famously back in New York when they looked uh, at, built a registry to look at 30-day uh, mortality after heart surgery, um, and they basically threw it out in, in, into the public sphere uh, without any warning, and it ca caused chaos. So we, we are working very closely with the community uh, in terms of how we build these measures. So it started back in 2004 where basically we asked these actors to tell us five things that they thought uh, mattered, that were actionable and important. Um, they came up with six, which was fine, um, and we started uh, measuring those metrics. We reported those back in 2015 at a region level. Um, then we added cost. Um, 2017, we reported the high-performing clinics, the ones who were in the top quartile. And then next week, we'll be releasing our community cancer care report, which will show quality and cost metrics for every clinic in the state, and it'll be publicly available. We're very big on transparency uh, and public reporting. We think that's the way to, um, uh, first of all, share information, but also to motivate change. Um, and we're not about naming and shaming. We're about helping practices get better. So we want to, we want the good, pra what we're telling the good practices is you're not off the hook. What you need to do is you need to tell the practices that aren't doing as well what you're doing so that they can get better. We need to facilitate collaboration across boundaries, shared solutions, and then as I said, we need to design pilots and experiments in the community to try to help improve care. So just to give you a sense of what we're facing here, I wanted to show one uh, measure that we've uh, built. Um, this is actually one that's recognized uh, nationally. It's uh, the oncology care model is a Medicare uh, program um, that's being implemented around the country. And one of the metrics they're interested in is emergency room use and hospital stays during chemotherapy. Um, there's no national data on this. Um, so we collected using our database, we looked at it for the state of Washington. And this is the data, what we found. So this is 2014 through 2016. Um, these, um, there we go. These, these dots are individual clinics. Um, this is 2014 to 2016. So look at that range. So these are individual clinics, and these are the proportions of patients who start chemotherapy who end up in the emergency room in the six, first six months after starting chemotherapy. So the best clinics less than 10% of those pa their patients are going into the emergency room. Uh, the, the ones that are struggling, almost half are going into the emergency room in the first six months of life. So that's a massive range. Um, the overall regional average was uh, 23%. When we combine this with patients who were admitted to the hospital, that's a separate metric uh, that I listed here on the bottom, what we find is 50% of cancer patients who start chemotherapy end up 
in the emergency room or in the hospital in their first six months of life. And that's largely due to difficulty or, or, or lack of a, a network or a system to control uh, the symptoms related to uh, and side effects related to chemotherapy over that time. This is another slide from our database showing uh, cost of, of care. This is early stage breast cancer, or this is breast cancer of all stages, but this is a cost in the first 120 days. These individual bars are the clinics themselves, and you can see the tremendous variability in cost um, between the highest and the lowest cost clinics. Now there is a difference in case mix, and you can see these less expensive clinics tend to see more early stage breast cancer patients. But among those where things are fairly even, you're still seeing 40, 50, 60 percent variability in costs. Um, and in theory, for uh, breast cancer, you know, we shouldn't see that range of variation. So as I mentioned, we're moving towards public reporting of uh, cancer quality and cost metrics. Um, the Community Cancer Care Report, which is coming out uh, next week, uh, will show uh, for, a, for the metrics that our stakeholders prioritized these quality and cost issues. And this is what it's going to look like. Um, so these are actually not names of real clinics, but these are actually dots represent cancer clinics in our state. Um, this happens to be for um, uh, adherence to um, uh, recommended treatment for breast, lung, and colorectal cancer. Um, again, these are not clinics that make any sense in terms of names, but the numbers are right. But what you can see here is variability in quality and variability in costs. So those will be um, released uh, next week. Now, it's fine to release this information. It will motivate people, but you've got to give the practices and the patients tools to try to get better. So we've also built something called HiCore IQ which is a data platform that the uh, clinics can use to go in and look at their own data and drill down very deeply to understand what's going on. Uh, basically, they can drill down to the doctor level. They can stratify by race, by age, by tumor type, all the information that we have in this combined data set so they can see where the problems are and hopefully target. Um, and this will also be available uh, at the same time. This will not be publicly, uh, this will not be publicly reported, but the oncology practices themselves can log in and look privately at this information. So this has been uh, a journey uh, getting to this point, um, and there are always lessons learned. Um, and we know that in providing this type of information that hasn't been available before is an opportunity and a threat. Um, and we've heard both sides from the oncology community um, some clinics are, you know, they're, they're seeing their data and they're rising to the challenge and saying we're going to do better. Others see a big threat to their business model and are afraid that they're going to lose patients when this information uh, is revealed. So that's something that's a reality that we're working with. Um, it does affect the community though and what, the way we've answered this is by involving the entire community and at every step of the way try to provide tools um, so that the people affected by this information can be effective in acting. So what I tell uh, clinics um, and people who are going to look at this report is that, you know, we can't afford the status quo. I've been seeing this variability in care and cost and access, these disparities that we've been talking about here at this conference for 20 years in my research. Uh, I've been publishing papers, publishing papers, but honestly it just hasn't captured the public attention. So this time we're going to make it public, but we're also going to build an infrastructure to make it better. Because we really can't afford to lose cancer care providers. Um, that is not what this is about. This is about raising the boat for everyone, bending that cost curve down to affordability and improving care. Um, May 1st, as I said, this report will be released. Um, if you type in HICOR on your browser, I, I think we're search optimized, so you'll go to our uh, Fred Hutch website. As I said, May 1st, I think around 10 or 11 o'clock, this data will be uh, available to everyone. Um, and on the 3rd will be our Cancer Care Summit, uh, where we bring uh, all of our stakeholders together um, for a, um, you know, to, to talk about this information and actually to plan how we can make things better in the future. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
you. Um, before we I go to see how you're going to moderate <laughs> Darfur and cancer care delivery. <laughs> well, we both ended our talk talking about a boat. That's so true. I think I think we came closer. There, there, right. there are there are things in common in, in, in some way. But before I, we we go to questions. Um, I want to make sure that everybody knows that the, all the talks uh, are being recorded and will be available on the B'nai Tara Foundation website in a few days. Uh, we have one question and I'll have yeah, a couple thank more. Thank you. So I was very interested in that second talk in the Virginia Mason and one of the things I had seen in Journal of Oncology practice a couple months ago and I think it may have been in JAMA Oncology too was the link between cost and where you get your care. And specifically, if your clinic is located in a hospital, which we are, versus a private, sta you know, an independent standing clinic. And the huge disparity in the cost of care because of the override, um, that's one point I'd like you to address. The other is rural versus urban clinics. And the huge disparity of care, again, based on other issues that aren't necessarily controllable within a clinic. And that's the second thing. And then the third thing, <laughs> I'd like you to well, maybe. Let's stop it too. Well, I, I'm going to just I throw this won't out. Remember the, yeah. the yeah, third one. All right. right. Well, I'm going to just throw this out. I think your points are well taken. That people are afraid of this information and how it will be used. And a lot of cancer centers, ours is probably no different than others, advertise quote better outcomes. And I think that's a really dangerous slippery slope and so I think if you can maybe capture two of those two of the three you'll get a bar of chocolate too. <laughs> <laughs> well um, we, we know, uh, you know first of all there's been tremendous change in oncology practice in this state uh, specifically mergers of independent clinics into larger networks Swedish Providence the University of Washington uh, Virginia Mason have been acquiring clinics uh, into the network and part of the reason for that um, there are many reasons but one of the reasons has to be, is financial which is that uh, when when clinics move from independent um, outpatient status into hospital based status the amount that they can charge for the same services goes up the services don't change but the charge goes up this was a, a big source of consternation to insurers both public and private um, and, you know, it will be reflected in this data uh, when we see the differences in cost. Um, let's see, the second question was on, see, I've already forgotten it. Sorry? Oh, rural urban, yes. Um, so, yes, there, is, there are issues that rural cancer patients face that are very different from um, uh, people here in Seattle in terms of access, income, many things. Um, we, uh, when, when we look, when we chose our metrics, we did keep that in mind. So many of the things that we're focusing on, and again, this is not us, and when I say we, I mean we as in the community, we're focusing, a lot of the metrics focus on things that we probably shouldn't be doing, excess imaging, um, uh, you know, poor quality, uh, too much aggressive care at end of life, um, that, that, you know, are different issues uh, for rural, or that are still the same issue for rural versus urban. So um, that, that is an issue. The emergency department issue is, is going to, there are going to be disparities there in the rural urban clinics um, just related to physical access. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't show them and we shouldn't figure out how to make that patient experience better. Uh, <coughs> this question is for Doc. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here's, I'll get in trouble. I have real problems with uh, cancer centers advertising, including our uh, affiliate uh, SCCA. I, I'm very uncomfortable advertising that uh, we, that uh, any system has better outcomes because frankly, as a person who has struggled to measure outcomes and to control for all the factors that can influence outcomes, um, it's, it's very problematic. Um, and I think we heard from someone yesterday at the debate about the problem of cancer centers advertising. We're not going to make that go away. Um, we, we do think this data, which we've worked very hard to be um, neutral, um, may be able to put a little reality on those numbers. This question is for Dr. Ramsey. Thank you for an excellent talk. I think 
I'd like to have you consider one or two other variables that you didn't mention. I'm sure you're aware of them, but you only had so much time. I've been practicing uh, medical oncology in the state of Washington for 35 years. And um, so that means that some of my colleagues are 20 to 30 years younger than me. Uh, I notice a huge disparity in the approach to um, uh, evaluation and treatment based on age. And some of that's understandable. I trained uh, when CAT scans were just being uh, developed. I spent half of my career without MRIs and two-thirds of my career without PET scans. Uh, my last practice, um, I got into debates with other people about the fact that women with stage two breast cancer at Tumor Board, it was respected that if you were a competent oncologist, you would order a PET scan on a patient with stage two breast cancer. Now, actually the data shown, when we used to do bone scans on those patients in the 80s and showed there was no value. There's no value to that either, but the point is this curve won't bend unless these doctors understand that they don't have to do that, and it's actually kind of not a good thing that they do that. I was the, in the minority. I got in a lot of trouble for speaking up. Now, when the ACA passed, I was excited because we all know that before the ACA, the driver of spending were physicians who were just doing stuff and put the, put the money into uh, hospitals because you can't run a private oncology practice anymore because of the cost of drugs and so on. So we're all now hospital-based. But the hospitals who employ us haven't given us a break about don't do all those tests, it's just the opposite. So um, with those comments, I'll let you address. Well, I think you, uh, you're very, I mean, your comments are very on target. Um, and I think when, when you see the disparity across um, practices in the ordering of those PET scans for early stage breast cancer, that was actually one of the metrics uh, that we measured, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty large. And um, the question is why? Uh, and it probably get, boils down to um, pressures to create RVUs. I feel this in my own general internal medicine practice, and I know it's exactly the same. Um, you know, if we're doing things that are not recommended just because the hospital administrator says we have to generate our RVUs, I view that as problematic. So I hope this data shines a little bit of light on that practice um, so that we can all talk about it and how to address it. Um, good morning. My question is for Dr. Erickson. And so you talked about how some communities, like the small communities, it's hard for them to get prevention care. And I've also, I'm, I'm from Minnesota, I've stayed there for a bit. This is also the same thing in Seattle, Washington, and throughout. So how do we um, break those barriers? Because sometimes it's not not having access to care, but sometimes is refusing access to care due to not understanding what cancer is. And there's a huge taboo in a lot of communities. Thank you. Oh, uh, that's an excellent point. I have family in Minnesota. My daughter lives in a Somali community. And I think that's a first step is integration, not segregation. And also having patient advocates that are of the same culture and background to say, I've been through that, I had ovarian cancer, you need to get checked and I'm gonna go with you. I think those community projects work well, and Minnesota has made some headway with that. I'm not as familiar with the Washington, uh, a little behind, uh, but uh, it, is, it is a problem, and you look at just the sheer stress of coming into a new community, a new culture for Minnesota. It's rather cold <laughs> uh, coming from the Somali climate. So just to get those to trust healthcare providers. And then ultimately in the next generation, we want to train Somali healthcare providers who can then take care of their own people as well. It's, it's a really great question. It's a tough one to answer. I think we're making inroads, but we're woefully behind uh, in, in encouraging people to go out and get prevention and not look at it as a mark, a scar, or something that's going to actually get people to shun them away because they have a disease they don't understand. And as you know, so much of it is so treatable, not just preventable, treatable and affordable. Um, and that gets into the financial toxicity part as well. But thank you for that comment. I do appreciate it. 
have a quick question for both of the speakers that uh, really kind of takes David's second, David Avalofi's second question and pushes that to an extreme. Um, Scott, you really have a nice scenario in the state of Washington where you have uh, an aggregate of large data sources that are useful to this community. How can you extrapolate those to other communities across the United States and really across the world to other settings uh, like the setting that you heard from Dr. Erickson and vice versa? What kind of uh, data metrics do we need for the refugee community that we can use to be able to understand what their cancer care needs are and then to ultimately be able to address those? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great way to bridge those talks, Chris. Impressive. Um, well, uh, let, let me just say that, there, uh, actually it was in your talk, there are cancer registries in every state uh, of the United States. We have 100% coverage our population. Um, and we have insurers who have data that can be linked with those uh, states. So we've uh, actually built our software and our processes, again, on a transparency model. And we are eager to export this to other states. The biggest barrier uh, is people, not the data. The data can be linked very easily, and we can generate these reports you know, in months uh, or weeks even if we get the data. It's getting the insurers, the registries, the other people who control the data to allow it to be linked, uh, aggregated, and displayed. Um, so that's, that's the biggest barrier in our country. Um, I'll let Dr. Erickson talk about the barriers in the developing world because they're very different, I think. No, they are, and, and I'll be brief on this, but uh, part of it is talking to IRB committees to allow this type of research to occur. Uh, I'm not blanketing this with every IRB, but the ones we've worked with, they hear migrant, refugee, it's like pregnancy, prison, they go, we're not interested. That can't be the attitude. We have to look at ways that are ethical to study these uh, needing populations, and also to really drive the data and I know this has been true in Damiano's work, Benet's work, you involve researchers, healthcare providers in that host country to be part of the research, to be authors on peer-reviewed papers, then you'll start getting data. The worst thing we can do is take the data, produce it ourselves, not involve them. That door is shut and we're 10, 20 years uh, in terms of steps backwards. So those are two quick solutions, I would think, far from solving everything but small steps that would help. And I think the point though about, you know, the people who are affected by this data need to be part of building the database. You cannot do it in a vacuum. It doesn't matter whether you're in a rich place in Seattle or in Somalia. If you leave out the people affected, you're gonna get pushed back and trouble. Thank you. I wanna close the, the session with a, with a wish that uh, what we heard this morning is, uh, is extremely uh, inspiring and uh, we, we, we get more knowledge but also new hope. I hope and I wish that uh, major institutions like you know, Harvard or the Hutchinson that has, uh, have the, the, the power of, of, of producing data and information and developing tools can also have a very strong impact on the policy makers uh, because I think the link between the two talks is the point to, to we need more policies, new policies human rights, uh, and, and who can really affect and impact at this level. I think that you have this opportunity. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we have a moderator. Unfortunately, not going to be a moderator.